Beautiful, beautiful number to prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I pray as we look into your word once again, Father, that you might give us new insight and understanding what happened that day, Lord, when your son rode that donkey into Jerusalem. And Father, reveal to us the truths, Lord, that are in your scriptures, that we might apply them to our lives today and leave more committed to you than when we came in. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful number. Thank you so much. If you'll take your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. We are going to take a look at what is termed the triumphal entry. That's the term that it has been given because Jesus Christ uh, chose this day to enter into Jerusalem like a king. And the people responded. And we all know the story so very well. But maybe this morning there will be something in here that, that really grabs you, that really hits you, and, and you see something in a different light that you can apply to your own life and your walk with the Lord. But what I want to do is, again, uh, we just had the scripture reading, but I'd like to read verses 1 through 11, and then we'll break it down together. So here we are, Matthew 21, verse 1. And when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt or a foal with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Jerusalem, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments on which he sat. And most of the multitudes spread their garments in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them out in the road. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred and saying, Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Here we have this account. Leading up to the Passion Week, this is the beginning of the Passion Week of our Lord Jesus Christ. He had, uh, he had planned this before the foundation of the world, that he would enter this city and the nation of Israel was offered a king, the king that God sent from heaven the Son of God, the Messiah, would they accept him as the true Messiah? And so Jesus had this laid out here as the Father had, had uh, predestined to take place. And we see first that he approached Jerusalem, verse 1, and had come to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus sent two disciples into the, 
and they were going to go into the town and they were going to find a donkey and a colt with her. Here we have Jesus approaching Jerusalem, preparing for his entry, and this little insignificant town, Bethpage. But one thing amazing about this particular account is that God uses small things to do his will. God chooses the little things and the, what seems to be to the world insignificant for his glory and his purposes. Here we see that he's, he desires a donkey and a colt that are already there. He knew they were there. And again, it's, it's a, a revelation of Jesus as the Son of God. For he would know that there was a donkey tied and a colt tied there with her. And they were there for one purpose, to be used of the master, to ride into Jerusalem. And he sent his two disciples. Why did he send two disciples? One for each. One for the, the, the donkey and one for the, the small colt. And he sent them in with those instructions. And as we see this, they, uh, Jesus explained to them, when you, when you get there, if anyone asks you, what are you doing? Why are you taking these? The key statement, and they had to say this exact uh, words to the owners of those animals. The Lord has need of them. That's it. And sure enough, they get there, they arrive, and there's the colt. There is the donkey, mom and baby, and they go and untie them. And as we see, look at, uh, uh, we see verse 4, that here we have the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given by Zechariah, verse 4. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Zechariah the prophet made this very prophecy and he had given this prophecy and the Jews knew this prophecy. They knew because of Isaiah saying one day your king is going to come into Jerusalem, come to you riding on a colt, riding on a donkey. And the people knew their scriptures. They knew their prophecies, many of them. And so when they saw Jesus, he had already claimed to be the son of God. He had already been by many proclaimed to be the Messiah. That now he was entering the city of Jerusalem the way a king would enter uh, after there was a victory won. Now, Jesus had not yet won that victory on the cross through and, and his shed blood and the resurrection. But yet, this was how kings entered cities after they had been victorious. In ancient times, uh, we think of, when we think of a general coming home with his armies, such as those in Rome, coming home, uh, they rode on a big white horse or black stallion and they're dressed in their armor. No, they didn't come to the city after a battle that way. They went out to battle that way, but not didn't come back. They came back, many of them, riding on a donkey. 
it was the custom back then that the, that the, the general or the king would ride on the donkey in a procession and that donkey, ride, uh, the king or emperor riding on that donkey or general, whoever was head of that army, they, they were um, g giving out the message that they have obtained peace through war. They had conquered an enemy and now they come back and the riding on a donkey represented peace that the king had brought back to his people. Think of that. So what are the, some of the titles for Jesus Christ according to the Old Testament? He is the Prince of Peace. That's one of them. He was the Prince of Peace. So I want you to understand this aspect of it, that the King of the Jews, the Son of God, the true Messiah, the Prince of Peace, was now riding on that donkey and telling Jerusalem that I am your King, I will bring you peace. Now, the people, of course, they shouted and sang his praises. And we see again what they shouted. Look at verses 6 with me. 6 through 9. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them. And brought the donkey and the colt. And laid on them their garments on which he sat. Now. Most of the multitude spread out their garments in the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the multitudes going before him and those following after him were crying out saying, Hosanna to the son of God. Son, I'm sorry, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is a statement that they would have proclaimed to the Messiah. And we think, wow, look, Jesus has his, his people believing in him, following him and exalting him. And giving him his rightful place as king of Israel. But in the minds of the Jewish people, when they thought of the Messiah, what they missed in the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies was the part about where the Messiah, the servant of God, whom God would send to deliver Israel, he would be, have to be a suffering Messiah first before he would be a conquering Messiah and a king that would rule over the nations. You see, they were all under the yoke of Rome. They felt that yoke, the oppression of Rome. And so their desire was, according to the prophecies of the Old Testament, they knew that one day God was going to send his servant, the Messiah, who would be king of the Jews, and he would overthrow the enemies of Israel. So the people gathering around, suddenly they saw Jesus sitting on a donkey, riding slowly down the Mount of Olives and heading towards the city. And right away, they began to think of the prophecies. This is the way the king, and again, that prophecy from Zechariah. This is the way the king is going to come to us. And so they all started gathering around, telling each other, this is, this is the Messiah, this is the king. He's going to deliver us from Rome and restore the kingdom of Israel. And so the people began to shout how beautiful it was. It must have sounded so amazing to hear the people shout these words. Of course, the word we have here translated Hosanna means save us now. 
That's literally what it means. It's a, it's a word of praise, but it's a praise to that person or to God. Save us now. They are giving, they, they are giving Jesus his due honor. They said, Hosanna to the son of David. So they knew that he was of the line of David. He was, uh, came from the tribe of Judah. So he was uh, in line to be king. And they said, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they were, they were praising God. Praising God and giving him glory. The celebration began. They were praising God. But many of them were praising him with a preconceived idea of what was going to happen. Jesus would enter Jerusalem. They had, they had just seen, and we will read it later, they had just seen Jesus raise a man from the dead. He brought forth Lazarus a week before. And so now the people are gathering around and they're saying, this has got to be the Messiah because of all the miracles that he did. They believed he had the power to overthrow Rome. They believed that he was the one that was going to overthrow Rome. And so they were preparing for this to take place. The, the people gathered around the road. They sang these praises to, the, to Jesus Christ thinking that he was going to come and physically take over Israel and destroy the enemy Rome. But that was not God's plan. And Jesus was concerned about the heart of the people. He was concerned about what, what they truly believe about him. Would they be willing to accept him as Savior even if the kingdom age is delayed and it is not the time. You know, there's a turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 19. All four gospels give the, the account of Palm Sunday. Luke 19, verse 41 No. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Oh. Sorry folks. I'm, it's 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 uh not 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 there. Yeah, it's in 19, but let's actually go to verse 28, okay? Verse 28, and after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, ascending to Jerusalem. And it came about that when he approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you in which you enter. You will find a colt tied on which no one has yet sat on it. This had to be an unridden colt to fulfill the prophecy. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why you are untying it, thus you will say to him, the Lord has need of it. You know what's wonderful about this, that statement, is the Lord has need of you. Each one of you here this morning. You may be going through your personal conflicts and life and you you're trusting Christ and you know you have a home in heaven but you're dealing with so many things in this life so many heartaches and su maybe sudden suffering maybe you got the word that cancer came and now you've got to deal with that you lost a loved one whatever the fire you're going through Whatever pain you are suffering, in the midst of it all, 
Jesus still says to you and to me, I have need of you. I have need of you. And we must understand that God uses those who many times his children are laid aside in suffering, maybe on a sickbed or going through terrible tragedy. It is those times that God is basically saying, I have need of you now. I have need of you to glorify me in your pain, in your trial. How many times have you seen a suffering <coughs> saint encourage you? You've gone to the hospital, gone to their home, and you try and encourage them. I don't know how many times I can tell you I've experienced that. I've gone into the hospital, and there in that hospital bed is a child of God who is suffering. But you go in, and you're expecting the crying and the screaming, you know, why me? And, and all upset. And yet, what do they have on their face but a smile? What do they have? They have joy. They have peace. And those are the things that suddenly are evident when you enter that room and begin to talk to them. And why is that? Because God has chosen this particular circumstance to use them to glorify him and to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in their body. And there is no greater way for us as believers to, to glorify God and to manifest Jesus to the world and to others than when the fire gets hot. That is when the Lord is saying basically to us, I have need of you. Are you willing to let me shine through you in your suffering? God has a purpose for every single thing that enters our life, both good and bad. So wanted to, you to uh, take note of that. But then as Jesus had sent them on, verse 32, and those who were sent went away and found it just as he has told them. And as they were untying the colt, verse 33, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? It's exactly what Jesus told them was going to happen. Somebody asks you why you're doing this, you tell them the Lord has need of it. And so they're asking the owner, verse 34, and they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and they threw their garments on the colt and put Jesus on it. Think of those owners, by the way, the owners of those animals. I wonder what God had been doing in those owners' lives before, up to that point. I can imagine that the owners of those animals had already perhaps dedicated everything they have to the Lord. And they came to the Lord and said, Lord, whatever I have is yours. Uh, you can use whatever you have of me. What, whatever you've given me here on earth, they're yours. And so you use them how you see fit and use me. That may have been their thought process and their heart. So that when they did come, they're asking these people, what are you doing? But as soon as they said those words, the Lord has need of it. They must have known who the Messiah was. They had seen him come through time and time again, heard his preaching, seen his miracles, and, and they knew when they said the Lord. They must have known he, they were t uh, talking about Jesus. And what did they do? I gladly give him to you. What a picture for us that everything in this life that God has blessed you and me with, I have to be willing to say, Lord, it's all yours. It's all yours, and you use whatever you've given to me to glorify you and to proclaim your glorious gospel and to let the world know that I belong to you. 
And so when God calls and says, I, and calls to your heart, and suddenly there's a need, and some of you, many of you have done that with the Williams family. When you heard of their kids desiring to go to the mission field or go to Word of Life, suddenly you heard of the need that Jaron had. What did you do? Many of you went with no one else knowing. You didn't know, let the right hand know what the left hand was doing, and you gave a gift to support him so that he might get to the Philippines to share the gospel. What did you do? You gave of your resources because it came from the heart. You, you gave unto the Lord just like this owner gave up the donkey and the foal and said, Lord, I'm going to do, I've, you've called me to do this. You have need of this. There's a need. I'm going to help. You know, I, as I think of the needs in our church, Nick asked uh, this morning that he needs two people to come and say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to serve in the gopher ministry on Wednesday nights to the three to five year olds. Is that, was, was that the ages three to five? Three to five. A married couple here? Two ladies that get together and say, do you know what that was? When Nick got up here, and mentioned that need. The Lord was speaking through him. And he was saying to you, dear folk. The Lord has need of you. Who will come and say, here am I? That's what he wants. Maybe this morning, God has been tugging at your heart for that need. Are you willing to say yes? It, you may feel a little out of your comfort zone. Maybe you haven't worked with that age group and you're kind of scared of it. If you're scared of stepping into a ministry because you feel unqualified, guess what? That's exactly who God's looking for. The Lord is always looking for one who feels unqualified, feels that I don't know if I can do this job. But would you hear today, is there someone here today that would say yes? And go to Nick, even before we, before we leave today, and go out and, go and, and find Nick and say, Nick, I feel the Lord needs me with those kids. It would be so beautiful to see that need met today. But here, as we go on, he, as... He, they, they give the cult to the, to the Lord Jesus. Verse 37. And now he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives. And the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. You see, they saw the miracles and they said, well, he's got to be the Messiah. He's going to overthrow the, the Rome now. Blessed is the king. Who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But I want you to see this part here. Verse 19, 39. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples rebuke your disciples why are they concerned about this the that that there is a rebuke uh, that they want to, uh, the disciples uh, rebuked that Jesus to tell them to tell the people to stop shouting their praises. And what does Jesus answer? And he said and answered, I tell you, 
if these people become silent, the what would cry out? The stones. The stones would cry out. Now that kind of that kind of image, you know, we can't process that. Have you ever heard a rock sing? Anybody? No? Well, let me tell you a story, and some of you know of this. But our family, when we used to travel uh, musically, um, we heard about this place called the Field of Ringing Rocks. It's near Upper Black Eddy, Pennsylvania. Now, there are some other smaller fields of these rocks elsewhere in Pennsylvania, just a few. But the biggest one, eight acres of these boulders and rocks. We heard about it back in the 1970s. My dad and my brother and myself and the family, we decided to go check this out. So we went to this, this place, the Field of Ringing Rocks. And how many of you have been there? Nobody. Look at that, just barely, one, two, two people. Make plans this summer to go. Because we went there, and we were, we, we were told that when you hit these rocks with a hammer, they actually ring. And they have different sounds, different notes. What? We had to say, we got to see this for ourselves. So we were told to bring hammers. And so we brought our hammers along. And here are these giant boulders everywhere, little ones, big ones, and we're climbing on top, and we hit, take the hammer, and we hit one, and it, it was unbelievable. It sounded metallic, and yet they were ordinary-looking rocks, but they had a ring to them. And then we hit another one, and it had a different note, and then another, a different note, all kinds of notes, these rocks were ringing out music. Well, we were so, my dad got this idea, hey, maybe we could use these rocks in our ministry somehow. So we, my brother and I went, scoured the, 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 the place and found three rocks we could carry. So they were heavy, but we found the smaller ones, like about this size, and we're carrying them to the car. We just picked them up at random because they were, they were light enough to, to carry. So we carry them to the car. We didn't see the sign that said, don't take the rocks. <laughs> but here we go, opening the trunk, putting them in. Suddenly the ranger comes over. What are you doing with those rocks? He looked at us and said, what are you doing with those rocks? I looked at him and I said, we're taking them home. Uh, he said, you're not allowed to take the rocks. Didn't you see the sign? I said, no, sir, we did not. And then I began to explain to him, you see, we're in a musical ministry. And then I began to explain to him what we do and that we might be able to use these rocks in ministry and music. Well, he was dumbfounded by the whole thing. And he saw we already had the rocks in the car. So... God, put, put, God had need of him, and he, just the right guy. He said, well, listen, okay, I'll let you take those three, but don't take any more. So we got permission. We took them home. Guess where we went? Right to the piano. We went to the piano, wanted to know what notes did we pick up? In those rocks, because we weren't trying to find certain notes. These were picked up at random, but there's no such thing as random with God. But we went to the piano, we found out we had an A flat, a B flat, and an E flat. Each, each stone had one of those notes. They were all the major notes for the key of E flat. Sort of like the bass notes you'd sing if you were singing in that key. So that we actually were able to use them and play a song. God had tuned the rocks for us. And so we added the real rock music to our group. And then 
we, then we started using them. And my brother was, uh, you know, the guy who, who, who best played it, played them. And so my dad would be at the piano and play a, a hymn or song. And my brother would pound the rocks out to the beat and, and hit, hit the exact notes. And it was amazing. And then, of course, this is the verse that came to our mind. That Jesus said, if you people, if these people won't cry out and sing my praises, the rocks are going to cry out. And we used them for years. I wish I had one with me. My brother has the rocks in Philly. But um, you probably don't believe me. Some of you are looking at me like, yeah, he's out. Yeah, he's out there, you know. Well, I have a 30-second video to show you. But it's not us, okay? It's not us, but it is, a, it is a group. I don't know if they were family. It looks like it probably was a family, but they were, looked like they were a musical family. They took their hammers and they went out to the field of ringing rocks, okay? And so this is what... They came up with. Greg, if you would run the video of the field of ringing rocks. And hey. Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe that? That was it. The praise the Lord. The rocks cried out. They cried out twinkle, twinkle, but they cried out. God wants the praises of his people. God wants your praises and mine. And that's what basically I come away with this from this story. He was looking for praises. In fact, here we are in, in uh, uh, Luke 19. Let's conclude by looking at verses 41 through 44. Because this is often missed. Because this is, uh, Luke is the only one that wrote this. Of this, what took, ha- what took place here. Look at verse 41. Okay. And when he approached... He saw the city, the city of Jerusalem, as he's coming down, and he wept over it. And he wept over it, saying, and now he's speaking to, the, to, the, uh, to Jerusalem and basically to all of Israel, but basically to the city of Jerusalem, who, who most of them were un, un, would not believe in him. If you had only known in this day... Even you, the things which make for peace. But now they have been hidden from your eyes. From the days shall come, for the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you. And you will not leave and they will not leave in you, and he's speaking to this, uh, the city itself, you know, basically, he will not, they will not leave in you one stone upon another in the destruction because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. There are three times Jesus wept. We know Jesus wept three times. Lazarus' grave, Gethsemane, and here, and, he, and all three times we find Jesus wept, what did he weep over? He wept over sin. He wept over the sin of unbelief of his people. And the, the sin that he would carry to the cross in Gethsemane, the sin of an unbelieving Jewish nation as the religious leaders would end up crucifying Christ, and many in that crowd later would be crying, crucify him, crucify him. 
Five days later then, they, he was arrested and he was taken. And then he was nailed to that cross. And nailed to that cross for you. The king, in the, the beginning there, as Jesus was entering on the colt, they were shouting out, the king is coming, the king is coming. But they did not truly accept him in their heart. And this prophecy that Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another, took place 40 years later. In 70 AD, Rome decided Jerusalem and Israel were too rebellious. And so the emperor Vespasian sent his son Titus, a general, with the armies of Rome, went to Jerusalem, surrounded it, and exactly what Jesus prophesied, they, they destroyed the walls, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple. That's why there's no temple anymore, because the Romans destroyed it. They didn't leave a stone, one stone upon another. This prophecy came true. That tells us that Jesus says unbelief will bring judgment. And that, think, that, that brings me to this other fact. That the king is coming again. He's coming again. But he's not going to be riding gently on a little donkey. And some people will cheer, some won't. But he is coming as king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19. And you can read about it. It's, you know the story, uh, the account. As Jesus is leaving heaven... It's time to conquer the earth and the wickedness on earth and the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation period. The skies open up and out of the sky comes Jesus riding on a what? A white horse. His robe looks as if it's dipped in blood. And he's ready for battle. And he's going to come with his word. And we are going to be part of the army riding behind him on white horses and we're going to join him and we're going to come down. And guess where Jesus is going to land first? On the Mount of Olives. Guess where he is going to enter as he comes down and lands on the Mount of Olives physically? He is going to enter into that same Jerusalem, the same gate that he rode through here. The eastern gate and he's going to go in but this time he's going to go in and take the throne of david and he's going to reign over all the earth and he'll set up the thousand year reign of uh, thousand year reign which we the church are going to reign with him and be part of isn't that exciting that you and i are going to be part of it forever and ever we are his bride but dear friends as we await that coming of our Savior, and of course we believe the rapture is going to take place first. Jesus is going to snatch us away before judgment comes. And then once we are in heaven, tribulation takes place on earth, seven years, then we will come back with our Savior. But because we don't know the day nor the hour, we ought to be ready. We ought to be ready and willing to say, yes, Lord, you have need of me. Here I am. What do you want me to do? How do you want to use me? And may there be praise on my lips, whether it be a time of joy in my life or a time of sorrow, I can always have praise in my heart for who he is and the things he has done for me. Praise him and glorify him and the world will see that Jesus is king. Let's bow in prayer. As we bow the right now before the Lord dear Christian perhaps the Lord is speaking right now to your heart and you feel him as it were calling you and saying to you I have need of you are you willing to say here I am, Lord, send me whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to give, I'm going to do it. Would you make your will his will?
right now. Just make that decision, Christian, if you haven't done so yet. And see what God will do and how He will use you. And then your life will cry out and praise the Lord through your ministry, through your testimony, through the way you live a Christ-like life. That will be shouting praise to the world that you belong to Jesus. Make that decision, Christian. If you're here without Christ, you've never given your heart to Jesus, but he came to die for you on that cross. He came to save you from your sin. And all you have to do is come to him as a sinner and admit you're a sinner and ask him to forgive you and make him the king of your life, the savior of your life. He will save you and you can be sure that your sins are forgiven and his precious blood will wash you clean and he will give you everlasting life as a free gift. If you're ready to make that decision, would you pray with me now? Just pray a simple prayer like this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I believe you died on the cross for me. You took the punishment for my sin. Come into my heart right now. Wash my sins away. I receive you today as my very own Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the dead. Lord Jesus. And with head still bowed, if you gave your heart to Christ this morning, you are now a child of God. You belong to him, dear friend. You have passed from death unto life. You've been born again spiritually, and your sins have been forgiven. Welcome to the family. Heavenly Father, thank you for decisions made this day. Father, may we understand, Lord, that your Son is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that we might continue to follow him faithfully, Lord, until he returns. Father, take our decisions, Lord, and may you be glorified in them. And Father, we pray that we will continually have praise upon our lips. That the world may see Jesus in us. And this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. As we can.